First of all, I want to welcome everyone uh, to the meeting today. This is our uh, February member meeting. It's open to everyone, even though we call it a member meeting. Um, so uh, we've been doing this on our uh, weekly critiques, and I thought I'd try it here. So if folks want to introduce themselves in the chat and uh, just you know, say who you are, what kind of art you do, maybe some something about yourself. And also as a way for all of us to get uh, to know each other better and create a better community of artists, you can also share your Instagram account in the chat and then uh, you might get some more followers and you can also find some more interesting artists to follow as well. Or even if you're not an artist, you can uh, find some of the other Boulder so uh, Art Association artists that, that are in attendance. So, so welcome everybody and uh, let's uh, keep going here. So um, uh, first of all, I wanted to announce every Saturday from 11 to 12.15, the Boulder Art Association does an art critique. And again, this is not for only for members, so anybody can, can join. And we're open to any kinds of art. It could be music, it could be visual art, it could be dance, it could be um, just about anything. So uh, these are really fun, positive, constructive um, meetings we do every week. So I hope some of the folks here can join. And I know some people on the, uh, on the meeting today come to that Saturday critique. Like I said, Beth comes and, and Jill and Jeannie, and it's, it's a really good, fun time. Um, and it's hosted by uh, me and Rick and Jeannie and, uh, and Jill. So I uh, hope you all can join us. Um, and then I just want to remind everyone, the Boulder Art Association has a partnership with Art Gallery in downtown Boulder. Uh, it's located a half block from Pearl Street on Broadway. And um, members can um, uh, respond to a call for entry to get uh, their art up on this wall. And um, uh, we've got two artists showing right now, uh, Nancy Sulo, which will be ending on the 14th, so that's ending coming up here soon, and Cindy Hinkle-Smith also. And uh, it, it's also just a great gallery with really great Colorado art from Colorado artists. And uh, we hope that you guys can stop by sometime and see the, the great art on the wall there. And uh, so uh, for the upcoming shows uh, at that art gallery space. We've got um, a call for art go that's gone out and uh, the deadline for entry uh, is March 14th and you send an email. Uh, Annie, can you help me here? I think it's info at Boulder Art Association, is that correct? Or no, it's submissions. Uh, that would be a genie question. I, th I think the submissions goes to who BAA you? submissions and I ah, put yeah. it in the yeah. chat. Okay, it's in the chat. So if anybody okay. wants to submit your art to potentially get on the wall uh, for uh, this coming year, that that's uh, where you can do that. And there's more information on our website, I believe. So um, uh, hey, hope you Ed, can sorry to interrupt. Yep. Uh, I also want to mention that you must have a current updated membership for this. Oh, yes. Good point. Yeah. I'm going to talk about membership here, here in just a second. So that's you do have to be a, an active member of the Boulder Art Association to to be on the wall. But this is a benefit of, of our membership. So uh, we hope artists can uh, submit. Uh, let's see. Uh, we had an art show which ended uh, just recently, but we've moved the sheep part of that show, the Ba show over to our gallery. And that's going to be up through April 4th. So if you folk, any folks missed that show at the Museum of Boulder, you can see the sheep. Uh, they're eight by eight uh, paintings and other mixed media kinds of art uh, in the theme of sheep based on our um, uh, old logo, which had a sheep on it. So this is a really fun show and uh, some really great art that is as part of that show. So you can see that now at the art gallery. Let's see here. Um, and then, as we mentioned, uh, your membership. Uh, membership is not very expensive. It, it helps support the Boulder Art Association. We're an all volunteer uh, association that's basically run by the dues that come in from our uh, members. And uh, we hope that uh, if you're an existing member, you can renew for 2021. Or if you want to become a new member and support us, that would be great. So uh, you can go to uh, the link on the screen and I think, um, 
um, Jill put that link in the chat as well. And then we're always looking for volunteers because we're an all volunteer nonprofit. And so right now we're looking for a board secretary, someone to help with public relations and uh, promotion of events and so on. And then we have three uh, great committees that are ongoing exhibition, marketing and education committee. And then we're looking for somebody to, to run the fundraising committee. So if you have any interest in helping out or becoming a part of the community, uh, please let us know at the email there. And uh, let's see, I, I think unless we have any other announcements, uh, um, I think we'll go directly to Randy. I, so I just wanted to quickly introduce a couple folks on, on the call today. We've got and Jean. Are you gonna talk about the March meeting? Oh yes, uh, I'll talk about that in just a second. And okay. so uh, we, we've got several board members on the call today. So we've got Jeannie uh, is our president and Annie is uh, in charge of the education committee. And we've also got um, Jill who is in charge of the um, uh, marketing committee. And uh, I don't know if Justin's on or not, but he's uh, on the exhibition committee. And oh, so Annie, you're doing education. So, um, but yeah, so we've got a great board uh, of lots of folks that work really hard. And so hope you can join us and uh, say hi to anybody in the meeting. And let's see, um, I wanted to just announce, I don't have a slide for this, but we just announced our latest, our next meeting, which is gonna be on March 9th. Uh, it's gonna be a how to critique with purpose. And uh, I forgot to write down the person who's doing that, uh, Annie. It's Virginia Unsold, and she did a, a member meeting about a year or more ago before COVID um, on critiquing and it was a really positive um, session. So I think this will be great. Everybody will be able to send in um, an image that you would like to have critiqued. And she's going to, we'll post this later, but she's going to provide three questions that she would like you to answer um, in order to do a better job of um, cr critiquing your piece. So watch for that. And we'll have to just, if we get hundreds of people wanting to do it, we'll have to go on a first come first serve basis. So when you get the notice, go ahead and register for it. Okay, yeah. And all that information will be coming out in uh, the, uh, the newsletter, uh, email newsletter, and also on the website. So, okay. I, I think any other announcements from the board or any other announcements before we get started? Okay, well, we're gonna go on to uh, our meeting with Randy now. So let me stop sharing here. Um, Randy, uh, or Annie, did you wanna introduce Randy? Um, go ahead, go ahead, Ed. Okay, so um, Randy is an incredible watercolor artist. He did a demo for uh, the Boulder Art Association a couple years ago, I think it was Randy. And uh, we had a full house. This is when we actually had a space where we could do meetings in the uh, Meadows, uh, shopping center and it was a full house and it was a great event and uh, he had an incredible setup with mirrors and uh, I was really impressed with uh, how he did the demo so um, I know several folks on the call also um, you know are followers of, of Randy and also have um, purchased his art so I uh, welcome Randy, uh, really looking forward to, and I think you can give a much better introduction for yourself, but I just wanna welcome you and thank you for being with us today and uh, um, look forward to, to seeing the demonstration. So I'm gonna switch over and uh, start sharing. Ye well, I'll, I'll wait till you're, you finish your introduction and we can switch over to your camera. Let's see if we can, there we go. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me, Ed and uh, Annie and, and the Boulder Art Association. It's been a while. I think it was so long ago. It was in the year BC. That was before COVID. <laughs> but uh, I did my demo for you guys. But fond memories of, of coming up there. And it was way up in the top floor of a, of a place where we, we were meeting. But anyway, um, tonight I'm, I'm going to be doing a kind of a more traditional watercolor uh, demo. It's going to be wet and wet. It's a snow scene and it's, it's somewhat tranquil. It's kind of in a falling snow type thing. We're gonna use a little bit of textures and, and, and things to show you how to do all this just for those of you who don't do this very often. And I think it'll be kind of a fun little, little painting to do. Um, 
So basically, this is the painting that I, I intend to do. And I'm going to switch over to, let's switch over to my um, other camera, Ed. I don't know if we can do that. Let's see here. How do I get this off? Did I pin this? There we go. All right, I have a, a little sketch done here. <clears throat> Very little drawing on here, just because it's mainly going to be all painting. And I'm trying to get this centered for you so that it, it makes sense to everybody. Um, these cameras are like working in a mirror backwards. So um, what I've got is just sort of a forested scene. And I'm going to take a big kind of a flat brush. It's about an inch and a half. And I'm going to wet my paper completely. I'm working on 300 pound paper that's taped all the way around. It's pretty stiff. It's not going to buckle be, uh, when it's taped down. But as I take my brush and I just start wetting the paper and glazing on some water over the entire surface of the paper, I'm going to let that soak in. I want to get it thoroughly wetted so that um, we have a nice surface to work with this wet. I've got my board elevated just a little bit. It might be a little much, so I'm going to take a smaller roll of tape and put underneath it just to lower the angle just a bit. And then once this is nice and wet, I will mix up a mixture of a little bit of cerulean blue and raw umber, mainly because these are both um, uh, granulating colors. They're both uh, um, sedimentary colors. And so they're going to leave a nice texture behind in the, in the uh, paper when it dries. And what I'm doing, I'm just, I'll swing over and kind of show you. I'm mixing up just a really nice wet mixture of, of cerulean blue a little bit of raw umber to, to neutralize it a little bit. Swing back over here to my, my uh, paper. And I'm just going to start glazing this on here, just kind of lightly. Throw it on. And I'm going to take a little bit of cobalt and add to this mixture with some raw sienna or yellow okra, whichever you prefer. They're both basically the same color. And I'm going to just drop in a nice soft background and just glaze it across the painting leaving a little bit of white over here. And then I'm going to drop down into the kind of these snow drifts towards the bottom. But I, I'm not sure if the camera picks this up, but you can start to see it's getting a little bit of uh, sedimentary texturing. And I'm working on a rough uh, 300 pound arches. So it really drops all this, this coarser pigment down into the valleys of the tooth of the paper, which uh, contribute to that nice granulating effect as well. I'm going to add just a little bit of warmth up here in the upper corner, take some water and just kind of drag that across just so I get a nice warm tone up, up at the top because I'm going to have some dark trees kind of uh, framing this whole scene and I want to have a little bit of contrast behind them uh, once this dries. So we'll just kind of work this in. I'll take my time because this paper is plenty wet. It's not going to dry right away. And I'm just going to let this have a chance to kind of settle down and we'll uh, pull some of this warmer color up into this upper corner, leaving some white back here. I've got a little cabin that I'm going to kind of frame around in a little bit. But for now, we're just going to let this kind of settle for a moment. I'm going to take some tissue. I'll wick up around the edges of the paper so it doesn't start um, blooming back into the or creeping back into the paper and creating really kind of unexpected blooms. And while that's settling down, I'm going to take a squirrel mop, kind of a medium sized squirrel mop. Let's see if I can find one here that's about the right size. Here, I've got two of them here, but I'm going to use this one by, it's in a Skoda brush. And it's a, a medium size, but I want to get a little drier mix. And so what I'll do is I'll take my, my uh, mixing well. I'm going to get some of this excess water out of it because if I leave it too wet, and I go to put some, some background trees in here, it's going to just go everywhere. And I want these trees to sort of sit there and still be visible, but not real hard edge. So I'll, I'll get a, a drier mix of the same colors I used in the background. And I'm just going to mix it up a little bit with uh, some of these colors. I'll add maybe a little turquoise to the cerulean and a little bit of the raw umber. And I'm just going to um, kind of drop in some basic tree shapes in here that are just very, and you can see they don't go anywhere. They just sit there. 
because the paint is actually drier than the paper. And I can change up my colors. I can add a few darks in here. I can get a little cooler with maybe some cobalt and some burnt umber to get a little, little steelier look to it and get maybe another tree over here that's up in this background area. And just kind of drop these in here while it's wet. Go back to my raw umber and get a little bit of warmth in here in a couple of spots, just so we have a few little changes in, in uh, the tree shapes. So we start to see a few different things emerging to give it variety. And I'll come over and do another couple of them in here. Keep it fairly soft. Add a little bit more of that cerulean to kind of neutralize some of this, get it a little darker. Just add some real loose tree shapes that are back in this forested area. And then as I get closer to that cabin that I've kind of loosely sketched out, I'm going to take a little bit of ultramarine and uh, burnt sienna and just throw down a little bit of dark around the edge of this cabin. Wipe all the water off my brush and just feather this away and leave that edge where the, uh, the cabin is. So it just sort of defines the shape of that cabin slightly. And we'll come in behind the chimney and I'll just leave some of that on there like that. I'll go back to my squirrel mop <clears throat> and I'm going to get a little drier paint, maybe a little bit of a, a manganese blue, just to change it up a little bit and add some, some darker tree shapes back in here and just flick it up to kind of simulate the, the uh, flow of the branches within some of these trees. I'd like to get a little bit of uh, warmer tones in there, but I don't want to get it too bright. So I'm going to neutralize some raw sienna and drop a little bit in to the underside of these trees and then get a little bit of uh, Prussian blue, a little neutral tint maybe, and come in underneath here just to get the, the shadow side of the under part of these tree shapes to create what looks like some shadowing within that forest. Now I'm going to uh, take a small round. It's just a, a medium sized round. And I want to get a few shapes that are reminiscent of the trunks. They don't need to be real uh, too defined, but I want to get a little bit of darkness in here that says, okay, yeah, there's some tree trunks in here, a few little things. And the, because the, the paint is not real wet, but the paper is soaking wet, they'll just sit there and soften. And I'll pick up a little bit of warmer tone maybe for one of the, uh, the branches with some burnt sienna. And we'll just kind of throw a little bit of this in here, make some of these a little narrower, clean my brush and get a little bit more uh, dark, like a Prussian blue or an ultramarine with some orange in it, just to neutralize it down to a kind of a warm gray. And we'll just put a few more trunks back in, in this forested area. So you start to see a few vertical things, and then some of them will be a little wetter so that we have variety within these shadows. And I can always take um, a little bit of a side stroke with this round and create negative shapes for our, the whites of the tree trunks where snow's on them. I'll take my flat again and uh, get it wet. And this time I'm gonna use one that's a little stiffer. It's got a, a really nice edge to it. It's a, I don't know if you can see that in the, in the camera, but um, getting it just slightly damp, not real wet. I can come back in and lift just a little bit of, uh, of light along the edge of some of these tree trunks. So it just sort of reinforces the fact that there's some tree shapes. And I, I'll put a few more, maybe that are just out here that are sort of a, just a skeletal tree that's kind of off in the side there. Now, while this is still wet, I want to take a smaller round, and I want this to be pretty dry. And I want to get uh, a little bit of Prussian blue and uh, sap green and raw umber. And these are going to be really nice and dark. And I think I've got it a little too wet. You can see what I'm doing here. I'm mixing up a darker color, but it has to be drier. So I'm going to pick a little bit more dry raw umber and that mixed with the blue makes a really nice rich green. And I'm going to come right over the top of these and just put some real soft little strokes in that look like the pine boughs of a tree that are in the foreground. And we're seeing the bottom 
boughs of this larger tree. And I want to get a little bit of cerulean blue now to cool this off and get some, some uh, lighter values. And we'll just kind of drop some of this in here. And then I'm going to take a, a little misting bottle. And it's going to make sure my water, my surface stays moist and also soften up some of these tree branches with just a little bit of mist, not water, but mist. And that'll help um, help us get to out to the edge here in the heart of this tree where we start getting some lighter values in there. I'm just drop a little bit of water in here. Maybe uh, see what happens when I tap it with a little, some of these drops fall off onto the tree area, gets lighter. And then on the underside of this bow, this main bow, I wanna get a little darker. So we start to see and drier paint. So we see some real nice little shapes emerging on the underside of this tree without a lot of definition. It just sort of is out there. And we'll leave this and let it soften. And I might actually use a, uh, a different brush here to get really dry, hardly any water at all. And I'll just come in on top of this um, wet paper with dry paint and just drop a few of these branches that are coming, come down almost like a dry brush in this wet and wet surface. And it, it, I'll throw in a little bit of cool in there. And you're just kind of playing with the end of your brush, just creating these little textural effects. Now, when at this point, what I wanna do is make sure the bottom of my paper stays fairly wet. I don't want to get a lot of dry lines. So I'm squirting this and I'm gonna come in with my flat brush that I use to glaze on the wet of the paper and just smooth out where the, the water is starting to, or the paint is starting to dry down here on the bottom part of the painting. Cause I don't really want this to be, you know, too defined. I wanna make sure that this stays nice and wet. And if can I need to- Can you move your, your palette, Thanks. your board up just a little bit? How's that? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. There we go. And we'll just throw in a little bit of a, a little more, uh, a couple of soft strokes in here of the cerulean blue to cool this off, just to tint the paper, leaving a little bit of white up in there. But I wanted this to be pretty, um, a little bit darker in some of these trees in the background without it being too obvious what we're doing. Just a few little hints of, of, of more obvious tree shapes even though they're back in the, uh, in the distance. We'll put a little cobalt in with this just to kind of create a little bit of dark. This'll, this looks pretty um, strong, but in reality, I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of a mister and it'll just start moving that paint around the surface of the paper. Sorry if this keeps moving on me. Um, so now this is really, really wet. We want to let that kind of settle down a minute. So I think what I'm going to do is move somewhere else in the painting and create some nice little negative shapes where there's some snow drifts or snow caps on top of some rocks. And I'm just going to throw in a few little of these, these shapes, take a smaller round or smaller flat and just soften the top, just throw some water on here to it's clean water and let the tops of this dark shape just disappear into some wet, uh, soft blending. And what I've done is now created little negative shapes here that will uh, kind of be reminiscent of little caps of snow on top of these little mounds in this background area. I'm going to pull a little bit of green in here, a little bit of the cerulean blue and, and raw umber, and you just get a few little shapes that kind of create these nice little negative shapes that are very soft and um, flowing and they just become basically like snow drifts that are kind of around mounds of vegetation, mounds of rocks, whatever you might want to imagine there. So we'll leave that and I'll come back in and, and work with these a little bit more. But for now, we're going to let that sit. And I'm what I'm doing is, is buying a little time to let the water on this paper settle down a little bit because I'm going to put some snow on this in a moment. I'm watching the shine of the paper as I kind of put my head to one side or the other. And sometimes you can see, see how shiny that is? That means it's still really, really wet. And if you do this too soon with the salt, 
it, it just is going to go everywhere. So I want to let that settle down and uh, we'll see what happens here as it starts to dry a little bit. I've got a, a dry area there I want to smooth out. So we'll just pull some water in there and let that kind of flow through these little valleys, creating little shaded areas. I'm going to come in between these trees with a little bit of uh, dark value to create some shadowy uh, areas of paint. It's got to be a little drier. Add raw umber to just about any cool color and you're going to get a nice soft mix. I want to clean my brush, wipe all the water off of it with tissue, and then just take this and soften and blend it right up into the background and uh, get a little cool, maybe a little ultramarine to this to cool it down and a little bit darker. And I'm creating, in essence, a a, a little horizon back here between these trees that's suggestive of that valley behind the, uh, the snow and the falling snow. I'm going to add a little bit of warmth to this as well, just to kind of create some, some dry brush effects. And then up against this cabin, I want to get a little darker, a little more uh, ultramarine, but add a little bit of burnt sienna to it. And I'm just going to drop right in behind this little snow drift a little bit of dark, clean my brush, get all the paint off of it, and just soften and blend away that edge. So it just has a real soft transition away from the face of that cabin. And I can actually drop maybe a little bit of water right into there and get a bloom going. You never know what's going to happen. It's always sort of a, a little bit of a kind of going to Blackhawk, you know, kind of a gamble. But by throwing a little bit of water in, you get these beautiful blooming effects that are just gorgeous. Um, I want the chimney to have a little bit of warmth to it. So I'm going to add a little orange to the raw umber. And we'll put just a little bit of like a stone fireplace shape, clean my brush, and just kind of drag this down so it's very soft. Add a little bit of cerulean blue to that to cool it off in a couple places. And then maybe just drag this down into the hillside below the cabin. We'll, we'll put some light in the window and do some things later to this. But for now, I want to just kind of um, get this a little bit slightly defined without too much going on. And then I'll come in behind the, uh, underneath the eaves with a little bit of cool color to define where the, uh, the overhang is in the roof. Clean my brush, get all the paint off of it, and take that dark pigment that I just deposited on there and just blend it down into the white paper. So we just sort of see the top of that, that uh, cabin appear. Get a little bit more on the other side of this chimney. And then I want to take a small flat. Where's my small flat here? Just a real small one and put a little bit of, uh, oh, maybe some orange on there for the top of the chimney, just a little tick of color up there just to give it a little excitement. Maybe a little bit of color in some of the logs. Come in with a little bit of dark in here. And that paper is still pretty wet, but I'm, I'm rapidly reaching the point where I need to put some snow on here. So I'm going to take water and just drop in on some of this uh, these logs that are going across this cabin just to give a hint of some texture on there. Clean this up a bit and just drag it down. We can always come back in and add more later. But right now, I'm going to take a little bowl. This is where it gets fun. I'm going to take a little bowl of salt here. Just take a pinch of it in my fingers. And I'm going to back the camera up a little bit so I can get a little higher. And I'm just going to kind of sprinkle some of this on the painting in the dark areas. It doesn't do any good to put salt in the white areas because you won't see anything happen. But if it's dark enough, we'll start to see the, the salt repel the pigment and create these little mini blooms that are reminiscent of snow, falling snow. Um, we can also take our small round and I'm just going to kind of tap a little bit of water into this upper tree here just to get some little dew drops and, and uh, texture to occur. It's already dried enough that I can come back with some darker color now and get a really nice dry application of paint on this squirrel mop and maybe create a little bit darker 
uh, set of, of marks in here to, to create the impression that we're getting some uh, more shadowed uh, pine boughs that are coming in as, and they're closer to the viewer. So we want them to be darker and warmer than the background. I also would love to be able to scratch out a few branches in this dark, but I've got to wait until this dries a little bit more because if I do it now, what'll happen if I scrape anything out, the paint is so wet that it'll flow right back into those little trenches where I've scraped out the paint. And uh, we want to make sure that we get back to the white of the paper and the paint is, has a dry enough viscosity that it won't flow back in and fill that trench that I've just scraped away. So it's a timing issue and you've got to watch your paper and, if, and sometimes you can do a quick little test. Now, see it's working. We're getting a few little white marks coming through this tree and it's almost like, oh yeah, we've got a few little branches and I'll put some dark ones on later. But right now I've got some really nice marks on here that are just kind of reminiscent of some uh, lighter colored boughs that are showing through the dark areas. And you don't have to do everything everywhere. Just a couple of these are very effective. So we want to just kind of flick those in there and get a nice, I'll show you, get a little closer, you can kind of see what's happening with these little white marks. It really is effective in uh, giving a little pop of white in there. So we'll back the camera up so you can see the whole painting. And you're never gonna see everything that happens with the salt right away. You usually have to wait 10 or 15 minutes for that to really take effect, which means we've got to move somewhere else in our painting. And this is a good opportunity to come back and work in the lower left part of the painting. I'm sorry, the lower right part of the painting where we can um, work where the paper's a little drier and let the salt and the background do its thing. So we'll, we'll take a small round, looking for where I dropped my round, here it is. And I'm going to get some warm colors to introduce in amongst these rocks and mounds of cool snow. So I'll take a little bit of uh, maybe some orange, mix it with a little bit of the blue. That's looking kind of green. So let's try a little bit more of the brighter, warmer color. There we go. And I'm just going to drop in some darks here and there. And we'll soften these. But we've got to have a few little darks in there to make this create contrast as it starts to move out from, um, from the darks into the shadows. So I'll get some, uh, some really nice darks, drop a few of these in next to some of these orange colors, and we'll get a nice blend of, of different effects that suggest a lot of rugged uh, vegetation, undergrowth, different things that are happening within the, uh, beneath the snow surface there. I'm going to come down against the top of this one little uh, bit of snow come back over on the other side, get a little shadow. And while that paint is still wet, we'll come back in and just give it a couple of flicks with a semi-dry brush. It's, it's damp, but it's not, uh, it's not wet and it's clean. So I can come back in and just kind of feather away the top of those marks so they kind of blend back into the, the background and become less obvious. So you want to just pull some of these darks down to create the glow that you get in shadows uh, as they kind of emerge out of the, uh, the light. So we'll get a little bit, a couple of these darks in here, maybe get a little bit more warmth to kind of be a counterpoint to the, uh, to all the coolness of this painting. And we'll drop in some cerulean blue in a couple places. And then I'm gonna just take a kind of a stiff coarse brush, squeeze all the water out of it. So it's just basically dry and just come back in and just feather the top of these marks up into the background. So it just kind of blends and blurs this color. And I want to get a little pink in here as well. So let's get just enough moisture on the end of this brush that I can pick up a little pink. Let's see if I can't just pull some of that down into the foreground. That's not working. So I'm going to get a different flat where I can get more pink on my brush from Opera and just pull some of this down into the foreground. Then, well, and that added just enough moisture to the surface of the paper now that I can take that color and just pull it away from these, these snow mounds and soften everything so it just has a nice glow to it. And I'll come back and get some darks and drop some of these darks in here just to really give it a little pop here and there of 
power, uh, power points of dark. Throw a little bit of uh, fresh, clean water right on top of those darks and it starts creating little blooms and textures. Get a little burnt sienna, drop that in here. And you can see how all of these things work together to create the, the colors we see in nature. If we're good artists, we observe and can see lots of subtle colors within you know, a landscape that the average person just kind of takes for granted. They don't look at it, but as artists, we have to look at these colors to really understand the, the huge variety that's out there that colors our world. So uh, I'm just adding a little bit of water, letting the water carry some of this darker pigment down into the foreground. Add a little bit of warmth to that as well to counterbalance some of the cool. Come back over this one and add a little bit more cool in there. And then you can always take a, a little misting bottle and just hit it once with a little bit of mist and it just softens things up. I'm not getting a, a much uh, salt reaction here. So if that happens and you see, start to see that you've got a little bit of an issue, you can always come back in and just hit it with a little spray bottle and then try maybe a little bit more salt up in the uh, wherever you've added the water. And it, I guarantee you it will work. So what you uh, now have, we've got a couple of little dips in the landscape. So I'm going to come back in. I'm just going to add a very, very subtle bit of tone to suggest that there, there's just a little bit of a dip. Add a little bit of warmth to it so we can get a little color that may be reminiscent of some bounced light back in these shadow areas. Add a little bit of water in there with a flat brush so that we get a little bit of uh, blooming occurring where it repels some of the paint. And that'll also introduce a little texture. And then we can always come back with a little bit of dark and get back in behind this with a little, little accent of dark and then clean, just squeeze all the, the moisture out of this brush and just feather it back up into the background. So we just see a very subtle bit of dark that defines the landscape without having to do much. And then we can come over on the other side with maybe some cerulean blue, maybe drop a little bit of that in there, wipe all the paint off, wipe all the water off, and just feather that up into the background. All right, now we're starting to see some things emerge. I'm gonna go back in now with a round and introduce some more shadows in between these trees. I'm just gonna take a little neutralized uh, deep blue. When I say neutralized, I'm just adding a little warm color out of my junk in my palette. And it's gonna add a few darks up in here that says, yeah, there's some, some color up underneath the canopy of some of these trees. Clean my brush, wipe all the water off of it and just flick it out away from the tree so it softens. And, um, there we go. So that just kind of gives us a subtle little suggestion that there's some depth in these trees that are reminiscent of shadows. I'm going to take a little squirt just to soften it. And I, I'm going to come back and get just a little bit of uh, some logs on this cabin, just sort of to, to suggest that it's out there and there's some texture and soften some of where I started a, a hard mark or a, a dark mark, I'll come back in with just water on the end of my brush and let it just, the water kind of grab that and make it disappear into the snowbank. And we can always get a little bit of dark down in the crevice behind the, the uh, fireplace to kind of define that shape a little bit. Add a little bit of warm color like a burnt sienna, but it has to be dry. If you use a dry color, then it doesn't go anywhere. It just sits there and it's, it's nice and soft. So we're getting, uh, we're getting some things going across here. I want to take a, um, probably my flat, this, this flat right here. It's a one inch flat and I don't want to have a lot of water on it, but I want to get a little bit of a shadow coming across our foreground. So I'm going to just take a little bit of paint on it and just come across with a dry brush in here. And then using this boar's bristle brush and a fresh tissue to squeeze any of the water out. So it's just really dry. We're not seeing the bottom of your page again, Randy. How's that? Can you? There you go. See That's what I'm doing? I'm just softening this. 
so that it gives sort of a, a counter to the, the bows that are up above and it softens them to the point where we've got some warmth and I'm using a little bit of quinacridone violet, it's a warm violet and just softening this completely up into the, uh, the drifts of snow so that we, we have sort of a, a warmth at the bottom of the painting that encapsulates our center of interest was where we have the, the most um, contrast. So that may be enough, but I'm gonna push it a little bit more so you can see it on the camera and just, just kind of glazing across this damp paper. I'm gonna get a little bit of a warmer color in here with some blue and sap green and just get a little bit of dark in here. Maybe get a little bit of vegetation that's coming up out of the, the background. And we'll let that kind of settle down and dry. And I just want to throw a little bit of water in there on that. Soften this so that it's just real soft. Maybe even throw a little bit of droplets of water into this foreground area. And that'll create little mini blooms that also kind of reinforce the, the, uh, the texture that we're going to find in that area. I'm going to drop in a few darks in here that are really nice. PowerPoints of darks. Clean and rinse out my brush completely and then just soften these marks. So you really don't see where they end or where they begin. They're just kind of down underneath some of these rocks. And it just shows the, uh, the brightness of the white on the tops of the snow caps because of the dark that we're putting in underneath it. It just creates a nice contrast and put a little warm color in there as well. Put some up in there. Pull my shadow out there. Um, it's working. Let's see what we're doing here. Let's try a little more of this, see if that helps. And then I want to get down in these little valleys where we've got some vegetation coming through. So I'm going to use this same brush. It's like an oil painter's brush or a, a scrubbing brush. It's actually a boar's bristle brush. It's very coarse. It's, uh, it's not a good brush. It's a junk brush. But the nice thing about it is these bristles are very stiff. And so when I dip them into uh, damp paint, it sticks on the ends of the bristles and I can create the illusion of a little bit of vegetation, some warmer vegetation. I'm gonna take a little bit of, of orange and a little bit of uh, gamboge to create kind of that warm color that, that we see reminiscent this time of year, maybe the willows or something coming up through the, uh, the snow. You get a little bit of uh, pink on this gamboge color. And we might see some of this coming across behind this, this little area in here just to warm this up. And it brings in some warmth into the painting, keeps it pretty soft, but at the same time, it really kind of is a nice counterbalance to what we're gonna do when we put the hard lines in there and we really get pretty uh, defined. So I've got a little bit more room here. I'm gonna put some more uh, burnt sienna in now down at the bottom to be like little bits of shadow at the base of some of this stuff coming out of the snow, maybe a little bit up in here, not much. And later I'll take a rigger and we'll put some taller cattails and things in there that really give it some definition. Um, the paper's still wet, but I'm, I'm thinking I'm gonna get a real nice dark uh, flowing, fully charged brush, this tree trunk color. So I'm gonna start with some burnt sienna Mix in a little bit of uh, ultramarine. And I don't want this too wet. I wanna have an equal amount of paint to, um, to water. So I get a really nice rich dark, but the paint has got to flow off my brush. And I'll show you, I'm mixing up a pretty oily mix of paint, but it's got a lot of water in it. So it's a fully charged round. And I'm gonna put some, some tree trunks coming out of here and it's almost like a dry brush. It comes, goes on so fast and I've got so much paint on here that I'm able to keep this flowing from top to bottom. And I can come back in, I can put a little, uh, I'll, I'll go with a rigger in a minute and put some other uh, dead branches coming off the side, but you can see how you can create a really nice illusion of trees coming up through here. And, I'm gonna add a little bit more warmth in the way of maybe some orange. 
on parts of this just to uh, warm it up, clean my brush a little bit so I get some of that orange to show up. Yes, and uh, I might have a few more of these smaller ones in the background coming up. It's kind of a thicket of uh, trees coming up out of this clump of uh, rocks and stuff and vegetation here in the foreground. Get a little bit uh, drier paint and really kind of darken, add some, some uh, solidity to some of these and have maybe a, a little stump or something that's down here at the bottom. Now, using a rigger, and for those of you, I think everybody knows what a rigger is. It's a, about an inch and a half long bristle, very skinny, kind of flexible. I can use that same color and I can create a few little uh, branches that are coming off the side of these trees to get a sort of a, a deadfall type uh, textures. And once I get up into the canopy, I want to get really pretty dark and I want to just create a lot of these branches that are kind of supporting the, uh, the underside of these boughs that we see. And if you get sort of a dry brush effect, so much the better. If you don't, don't worry about it. It just, you're just creating the, the little nuances of the branches under the canopy that the average viewer is gonna be able to see. And you wanna have a few of these a little darker than others so we can really understand what they're doing and you get lost in all of the, uh, the structure of the underside of the tree. Come back in with maybe a few little uh, dry brush textures on these tree trunks that are, maybe you got a few little old uh, limbs coming off of them. And that uh, defines that. I'm gonna use that same color to create a little bit of a uh, frame around part of the window this cabin. I don't want to put too much on there, just enough to say that there's a little bit of structure there that defines that open window or that light in the window. Put a little bit of orange or something in there just to kind of give it, it's still wet, so we can drop that in there and it blends nicely. And you just drop this in like so. We might have an, this, I don't know what this was here, but I'm going to make it into a tree. It looks kind of interesting. And it is kind of creating this illusion that maybe there's something off here to, behind this thing. And I'm just going to take a brush and soften that back like shadow behind this little tree shape. Get a little bit of warmth in there as well. And you know, you could paint with your finger too. It, you really, there isn't any one particular brush that's the perfect brush. Any of them work. But I'm just trying to uh, throw in a little bit of texture in here to say there's, there's a, a, a snow covered shape right in front of this tree. And then we're going to put a little coolness underneath it to indicate that there might be a bit of a shadow on the underside of this. Just to anchor it or, or tie it to the ground. And I want to take my, my brush that has the brill, boar's bristles wipe most of the color off. Actually, I'm going to clean it so it doesn't have any color on it at all. Take a tissue and, and squeeze out all the water. So now it's just barely damp. And I've got these little places I touched the paper with the end of the bristles. I'm just smoothing those out a little bit to add some warmth in there. And uh, I'm going to get a little bit of yellow in Ross, Ross or yellow okra and put maybe some a little different tone of grass right down in here and let it come up over the front of some of the trees in the background. And then we'll get some dark burnt sienna and create little dark bits underneath it. Maybe a little bit of uh, cobalt and ultramarine to get just a, a touch of dark at the base of this that, that symbolizes a, a little bit of shadowing. Maybe get some in there. That's too much. So we'll clean that up with a little bit of water. Clean our brush. Just feather that away. I want this to be, it's drying a little bit too. Uh, there we go. I want to get a little more shadow in here just to anchor this side of the painting and soften that. 
as it comes up into the white drift. That creates a nicer tie in and it really makes this white a little more dramatic up here. We probably need to get a few more um, little branches. <clears throat> so I've got to work to get the right mix here on my brush, maybe a little raw umber, get some, some little things that tie these trees together, keeps them all kind of in the same thicket. And so we'll just add some cross members of these things that come down and tie it to the, uh, the cabin. Nothing intentional, it just overlaps it a little bit. There we go. So now these trees are the darkest dark in the painting and they kind of take on a much more important role because they come forward, they're warm colors and they, they, you know, they don't really spell out any one individual tree. They're more of a, a series of trees that are all kind of lost there in the thicket. And uh, it helps the illusion of just all being part of the, uh, the foreground, but they really push that background back farther away from us. So now I'm gonna uh, see if we can't clean my brush sprinkle a little water into this area, see what happens. It may not do anything, but I'm gonna put a little bit of a distant, kind of a, I don't know, a ghost tree back here into the background. And we'll just have a few branches coming up that says it's kind of one of those old dead trees that are, you barely see through, the, uh, through the, the weather. And we'll put a few of these darks in there that says, there's something that's a little farther back in the, in the trees, in the forest, and pushes things back so that you really have some depth in that forest of trees. Um, I want to get, I'm waiting for this to dry. I'm going to use my heat gun while we're talking and just dry the bottom of this a little bit so that we start to uh, have dry paper to work on for some of our finishing touches. And um, I'll go back in and put some darks on the tops of that tree in the boughs. Right now, the, the, the boughs are all very, very soft, but we want to try to get a little bit of, uh, I don't know, a little bit more defined brush strokes in a couple places. So I'm just going to maybe throw a little bit of, you know, a couple of strokes on here that are just very, very light and just a, a couple of places, just sort of to give the wispy ends of these pine boughs coming down. And maybe there's a couple going up change our color to a more of a raw umber color and then pull some of those up out of there as a dry brush effect. Add a few little colors in here where the, the limbs are. And uh, then I want to take maybe a little bit of the, uh, the, the warm violet and mix it with a little bit of gamboge. So you've got sort of a warm red, reddish violet mixed with the bright warm yellows and we'll come back in and we'll see if we can't put a few of these little shapes in here that look like there's some vegetation or something down in the foreground and I want to put a few little cattails down here in the foreground we'll just put a, a couple of little tops to them and they're still a little damp so these tops kind of feather out the way cattails do I don't know if we have cattails in the winter but it makes for a nice design element. So we'll put a few of these in here and get a few things going and add a little bit of cool color to that. Nice little puddle of blue there. I'm gonna just add water and see what happens. Push that in around behind some of this stuff. Add a little bit more of the warm color. <clears throat> And then I want to take a, my small, it's like a three quarter inch flat. And we'll just kind of drag a little bit of cool color across some of these snow caps so that it pushes some of them back, brings some of them forward. Some of them will just take clean water and we'll drag a little bit of the background color across some of these, just so we have a varying amount of white. It's not all exactly the same white. You want to change it up so we've got, you know, the, the, the secret to a good painting is have lots of variety in your shapes, your values, and uh, always give your, your viewers a place to go. 
you want to give them a destination in your painting. So in this case, we're kind of coming up to this really snow, snow uh, blown draw where there's a lot of blowing snow and drifts and there's a cabin in the background. So we've actually given them a little something to, you know, latch onto as a destination. <clears throat> I'm going to throw a little bit of dark right in here just to kind of give us a nice contrast and just soften that. See if I can't pick up, there we go. And I, I think that, that just kind of makes it pop a little bit. Maybe we come in below that a little bit with uh, just a, maybe something down. I think that's about right. Now, let's, uh, is this, dry? this is still pretty wet. So we're gonna come in with another little tree shape maybe. And you don't want them all perfectly vertical. You wanna have some uh, oblique angles to them so that they tend to look a little bit more natural. That's probably too dark. So I'm gonna just soften that with a little bit of water and then just take a, a whatever junk I've got in my mixing well here and add a little bit of uh, something out of the side. It looks like it might be some old tree branches that are kind of breaking off somewhere. I'm gonna put a little bit of dark on the side of this tree trunk as well. <clears throat> So far, I think it's going all right. We'll put some other verticals in here that suggest that there might be some tree shapes going up through this uh, kind of misty atmospheric background. <clears throat> and we'll uh, get some darks up in there to just sort of give it the suggestion of that there's a trees in there that are showing just a, a hint of shape to them, not, not a lot. Where's our whitest white? It's right in here. Where's our darkest darks? Right across the top of it. All these darks down here in the lower right are pretty soft, except for the negative shapes of the rocks. I didn't want to get too, uh, too dramatic with the rocks, so I'm going to take a damp brush and maybe just come across some of these and just the ones in back and just soften them. See how that brings that one, one white snow-capped rock up a little closer to us now, just by knocking a little bit of the value down on the back, the back one. I'm going to add just a touch of warmth underneath the snow where this rock is exposed. Maybe a little orange in there somewhere. And that pulls the rocks forward. I think I need to get a little more dark in, in my bushes here, so I'm going to add just a bit of uh, warm tone, get some actual texture on there, and then maybe take uh, a little bit of the warm violet, see if I can get it on my, my uh, rigger, and just have some, some little marks that come up over the, the little berm of snow behind it, so we feel like there's some a bigger bush there that's a little more substantial, and then coming in underneath it with just a little bit of dark, so we've got a little shadow on the bottom of some of these to anchor them. Soften it just a bit, pull some of that dark up into the, into the bush, kind of tie it all together. And then clean my, my bristle brush, see if I can't soften this line here a little bit. Maybe we have some rabbit tracks or something going through the snow. What do you think? Would that be something we'd want to do? We'll uh, see if we can't put a few little soft marks in here. That, and I'll, as soon as that dries, I'll add a little dark to the inside of those little holes. I'll actually dry it right now. Now 
then we'll take a clean brush and soften the back of those marks so they blend up into the hole. Pick up a little bit of that and then just have some tracks going through the snow. And those are a leading device to kind of lead the eye up towards the cabin as well. Maybe we've got just a touch of dark back in here somewhere to kind of redefine the edge of this fireplace. I think that helps add a little bit of uh, substance to that. That tree didn't work out, so we're going to eliminate it, make it a bush instead. And then we'll just come, come across there with a, a few little thing that looks like logs. And we'll let this dry and see if it needs anything else. I think we're, that went pretty quick, but it's a fun painting. And it certainly is uh, winter. I think it's, it spells that out to us that it's cold. And that was the dominant feel that we wanted to create is a, a feeling of coolness. We've got a little bit of snow in the forest. Some of the trees kind of bloomed and blossomed and we've got um, some negative shapes over here in the vegetation in the lower right, a cabin off in the distance. <clears throat> We've got a little bit of, uh, let's see if we can't put a, a few little dark marks to create um, some definition for this, this bush. We'll leave that as is. I kind of like that. What do you think, Ed? Does it look like we're about done? Uh, I think so. I was gonna... You never know, you know, until you get there. But you know what, what Annie always tells me? You know, it's, you, you need to stop because you don't want somebody to come up to you later and say, you know, 10 minutes ago, that was a great painting. <laughs> it's right, always yeah. better to, to stop and live with it for a bit and then decide, do I need to do more? Do I need to do less? But when we're painting quickly, and I like to paint pretty quick because um, it, you get in that zone as an artist and you really start feeling the painting. You start painting more intuitively from the heart instead of overthinking it. If you take too long to paint, I find a lot of painters get real tentative and that brings on stress because they're not sure about what step to take next. And if you can just kind of have a plan in place, which I did. I, I knew kind of where I wanted to go with this. I knew the general uh, values that I wanted to create. So I just went with it. And like I said, a lot of times you're kind of rolling the dice on what happens with texture, whether it will granulate or whether it will bloom or whether you'll get these nice feathery dark marks to create value contrast. But if you paint long enough, you can pretty well anticipate what's gonna happen at each turn of the road. And you don't have to stop and think about it too much. You, you wanna just keep painting quickly and uh, move through the painting and always move to different parts of the painting to let other areas dry, uh, particularly in watercolor. You don't have that problem in some of the other mediums, but with this, you really do because if you don't um, move away and let an area settle down, it gets out of control and it starts getting muddy and you start losing definition. So this is, uh, I would say this is pretty much kind of where I want to go with this. I think we're it, done. Yeah, Randy, it looks done to me. I think it's a, an amazing painting. <laughs> well, uh, it was great to see it all come together. Um, I hope uh, it wasn't too quick for everybody, but this is pretty much how I paint. And, uh, it's a lot of fun when you paint this way because you can really um, get the spontaneity going, which is what makes watercolor so valuable. It, it just is such a spontaneous medium. And if we, if we overwork it or we try too hard or we, we try to overthink each little mark, then it gets a little tedious and you, you lose that spontaneity. And uh, so we just always want to uh, just let it flow and see what happens. Yeah. So, and I, I I think anybody who's done art knows you, it's very easy to overwork a painting. So I totally understand what you're talking about. So um, I just wanted to just to let everybody know, I've had quite a few people come in after the introduction. So feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to uh, comment on Randy's art or if you have any questions at all. Uh, we wanna make this as open and interactive as possible. So please, uh, 
um, unmute yourself. One, and, one uh, thing I might add, Ed, is yeah. I heard you talking about Instagram earlier. Um, my website is Hale Gallery, and my Instagram handle is Hale underscore gallery. So if anybody wants to see what I do, I, I post stuff um, multiple times a week on Instagram, so you can kind of keep up with what I'm doing if you're interested. And um, the, the website has all of my workshops, and you can also sign up for my newsletter on my homepage of my website. It's uh, www.halegallery. So um, yeah, anybody has any questions, I'm more than eager to uh, address them, so. And you, and you know, Randy, I, I uh, get your newsletter and they're really, really great. I love seeing your art come through in email. So I, I highly recommend folks signing up for that. Well, thank um, you. Yeah. Um, uh, any, uh, so we have a couple comments. So there's a comment from, um, let's see, let's see, Colette says, beautiful demo, demo, nice job, Randy. Uh, lots of thanks and people sharing their Instagram information. So yeah. um, uh, is, Randy, is this uh, painting gonna be for sale? Uh, sure. Okay. I, I, so I don't charge much for my demo. So if anybody's interested, this are $150. Um, they're more than welcome to, uh, to jump in there if they want it. Uh, actually, what I should do, why don't I, I get this to Annie and you guys can uh, auction it for the association. How's that sound? Oh, that would be great. Yeah. Wow. And then you guys handle the sale. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very that generous. Be... Thank you, Randy. Yeah, sure. thank you. <laughs> um, we we're getting a thank you from Mary Waddell and uh, Reed and uh, Randy. Did, hey, did Wendy Leewood ever get on? Or is she going to watch the video later? She's in Ireland. She's the <laughs> one who, uh, she emailed me. She'll be watching it later because oh, okay. it's 2 a.m. Oh, we gave her a shout out. <laughs> I have a question, Randy. Yes. Uh, are you working from an image? I mean, what was your original image or, you know, how did, did you just make this up from your imagination or do you have a photo or an image you were working from? Well, I, I taught a class last winter and we were working with um, just winter scenes. And I came up with this, trying to get this background, you know, to be kind of soft and atmospheric. And then uh, eventually at one point in the last 10 months, I added a cabin and I've just, it's kind of evolved in my head, uh, but I wanted to, to create a composition that kind of framed the, uh, the background so that we had a definite foreground, we had a middle ground and we had a background and the part of the painting that's very defined and, and cl has clarity is your near foreground. Uh, and then everything else pushes back and gets cooler and cooler. And as we know as artists, cool tends to recede. So to get that atmospheric perspective to make things feel like they're a little farther back, you always want to use a little bit cooler values. And then the things that come forward, which is what I've got here in the foreground, are these warmer tones of the vegetation that's peeking up through the, the terrain. And those tend to pull the foreground towards the viewer because they're warmer and they're darker. And uh, it, those are just little kind of rules of the road that really help a viewer understand the depth. You know, we all know we're working on a two dimensional surface. So we have to work a little harder to create that sense or sensation of depth um, that makes things feel like they have uh, dimension and, and uh, volume. And so we do that through temperature. We do it through, um, edge clarity, you know, whether it's a soft edge versus a hard edge. The, the hard dark edges tend to be something we focus on and we come, they come forward. The softer things go back. My little cabin back here, it's got some darker, warmer values, but they're not real crisp. It's just kind of a, almost implied that it's back there and you feel it, but you don't, it, it's like looking through the snow. You, you don't have a real clear definition. You just know it's there. Whereas some of these rocks up here in the foreground, you definitely know they're right close to us. The tree trunks are darker, they're closer to us. And all of these are elements that we, we put into a painting. Uh, and the more we paint, we know that these are things we have to have in order for us to, uh, to make it readable to the average viewer, especially from across the room. You wanna be able to have your values really pop so that uh, we see 
see everything we're supposed to see. So, um, Randy, down. I have uh, a couple of images that I found that I think you had sent to us. Um, I thought maybe I'd share those. With sure, folks. go ahead. And maybe you could talk about those. So this was an image and then it goes with, there's a second one here. And this is, I think is your painting, right? Yeah, we do. Uh, we work a lot from photos and rarely do we have the opportunity to take a really stellar photo. Usually they're pretty dumb. And you look at them later and you go, why did I take a picture of that? And, but then sometimes if you take a couple of photos and you lay them out, you can say, oh, I could make a much more interesting composition if I combine elements from the two different photos and make a, a composition that has more content, a little more interesting stuff. And this particular class I was teaching was on shadows and we, we worked with uh, cast shadows, form shadows, the color bounce in shadows, and you got a real sense of depth with this and also the glow of the shadows. So um, I think it, it, it was, they're just kind of abandoned shacks but I put them in one composition to make it a little more interesting, a little more fun to look at and explore visually as you wander through the painting. I always like to give people enough information that they can wander, they can explore, they can uh, really, you know, look through the whole painting, but you always have to give them something that's a lot darker next to a lot lighter value, which is a landing spot. And in this case, it's this fence kind of in the immediate foreground that's casting these shadows that's really dark against that mid-tone in the background. And it, it just comes forward towards us because it's got such um, impactful value. It's, it's got a nice dark value that comes toward you. Okay, so I have one, uh, two more here. So this one. Uh, this is my dairy freeze. <laughs> it's a dairy farm in Wisconsin and it was snowing. And uh, in this one, I had a couple of barns, photos of a couple of barns. And I put the whole thing together and I knew I needed some really dark, cool darks behind this thing to make it pop forward as a negative shape. And I didn't want to get too I didn't want to paint individual trees. I wanted a big shape so that the negative shapes were what we really looked at. But the lead in and the shadows with the snow into the driveway through the gate uh, was, was really led us to where I wanted you to look, which was this big red barn that was kind of falling over. And then kind of as a side note, I said, well, let's put some mailboxes out by the tree, out by the street. And all of these things kind of came together I used my spray bottle down in the lower left at those the posts for the mailboxes, and they just started running down to the bottom of the paper, and it created this kind of nice uh, undulation of values. And I thought, well, that's really nice and soft. Nobody's going to, you know, stop there. They're going to look at that, but they'll keep coming into the gate, and it'll lead us through this drive back to the barn, and the dark values push up on either side of the barn to really draw our attention to the, uh, the silo and the, and the large uh, multi-storied barn with the cupolos. So it was kind of fun. Yeah, and, uh, I, I think it's great. And I, I think what you said about hard lines make things go back and soft lines bring things, oh no, no, hard lines bring it forward and soft lines make it go back, right? Right, if you look at the trees way off above the little house, way off to the left, those trees are barely painted in. The sky above it is pretty soft. All of that's very cool and, and not very defined and lost a lot of edges in there. But as you move towards the center of interest across that, that grove of trees in the back, the trees get darker, they get a little more, uh, they become a, a, a more dominant shape that really pushes up against the negative shape of the barn, which is what draws our attention. Typically people don't look at the darker shapes they look at the negative shapes. And so the darker the dark is next to the negative shape, the more attention you will draw to your negative shape. Okay, and then see, we have one more here. Three sisters. These are three commercial shrimp boats. And I had a kind of a boring picture of these three boats along a wharf. And I decided to really darken the wharf behind them. I didn't really want to get into a lot of detail back there. So I just kind of let the background be dark and that dark served as a device to really make the negative shapes of the three boats the dominant center of interest. The sky all got 
you know, warmer and darker value as it got down towards the land. Uh, I painted the sky right down around the boats, let it dry. Then I came in with the dark land mass behind the boats and just blended all that in and kept the, the couple of buildings that were on the wharf pretty soft, not, not real hard edged, because I really wanted the eye to keep coming back to the, the light on the, the lit side of the boats. Uh, the, the, re the reflections in the water are just as important as the boats, but you glaze over those so they're not what draws your attention. You really look at the boats, but you feel that they're on water because of the reflections. And then dragging a few brush strokes across those reflections gives us the sense that there's a little breeze rippling the water, breaking up those reflections just a bit. And it, uh, it makes for a fun painting. You notice uh, the way I did our tree trunks in the painting to, tonight, I used that same kind of a uh, technique to create all the rigging and the lifts and the net um, wings on these fishing boats. Didn't put a lot of detail into it, but it feels like there's a lot of detail because the, they're dark against that lighter sky. And you, you look at those and you know that they're part of the, in, they're integral part of the structure of those ships. So it, it tells a story without having to get too much into a lot of minutia. Yeah, and I, I mean, I just, same with the other one, I just see the hard lines and then the soft lines and, and it, my eye just keeps moving around the painting. I think this is a really amazing painting. Well, thank you. You, you always wanna keep your viewer exploring. If, the, yeah. if you only give them one thing to look at and everything else is kind of quiet, then there's not much to, they look at it, they observe it and they move on. But if you can keep, you know, keep them involved and let them be participating by seeing things that they tell you they see in the background, they'll, they'll say, oh, I see this and I see that because they may have seen something similar on one of their travels and uh, they, they bring their own experience to a painting. But the reality is you keep it pretty interpretive, pretty soft and let them read what they want into it. And, and just really focus on your center of interest being what's the most defined. Yeah, so um, we did record the event today and Jill just put the link to our YouTube channel in the chat. So if anybody wants to watch a replay, uh, please uh, look at that in the chat. And Randy, I wanted to show you, I found the last time you presented for us was in April of 2016. <laughs> and you're right, it, was on, it wasn't It was in the Meadow Shopping Center. I think it was in the top floor of, uh, uh, I can't remember, gold something, anyway. <laughs> I had to navigate an elevator, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so here's your setup with the mirror that you have, which was just amazing to see. And uh, just like today, we had a full house of uh, folks uh, watching that demonstration so oh, you're you're awesome to pull these up i i didn't even know you had these <laughs> <laughs> uh, i found them in our meetup on our meetup page so yeah that was great so cool. um any questions for randy before we close and i have a couple quick announcements before if you're any and feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask randy a question hi everyone i j and sabuni i just want to know the andy uh, randy are you taking the class my what? Taking class. Oh, my teaching class? Yeah. Um, if you go on my website, Hale Gallery, under workshops, you'll see all of my classes. And I have, gosh, I don't know, I got, I think, eight or eight or more this month. I had eight last month. I've got classes in March. Uh, I've got demos. Um, I'm teaching almost full time over Zoom oh. now. And you use the watercolor paper or handmade paper? Uh, watercolor is my medium, transparent watercolor. And paper is a handmade? Um, say again? Handmade paper for the oh, water? No, I'm working on arches tonight, but a lot of times I work on uh, the Kilimanjaro or Fabriano. They're both the same paper. Oh. So I like the, uh, the, the texture of the cold press, 300 pound Kilimanjaro, okay. Cheap Joe's or the Fabriano. I think I, I'm about 99% sure that Fabriano in Italy makes uh, the Kilimanjaro as a private label paper for Cheap Joe's. And so it's a little less expensive than Fabriano. And I, I enjoy it a lot. I also have cases of the arches, 300 pound. And I have one, about half a case left of the 400 pound arches rough. So 
I, uh, I like the texture you get on the arches rough. Thank you all. Sure. I really enjoy your art. Well, thank you. I, I learn a lot. <laughs> and, and Randy, I see all the paintings in, on the thank wall you. behind you. I guess, I guess you're in your that's, studio. Uh, the three sisters you just had up on the on the screen. And oh, then man. I just painted another one of St. Ives in Cornwall. And I entered that one in the National Watercolor Society uh, show. And the three sisters I entered in the Pikes Peak International just about a week ago. Okay. Uh, that's great. And so I have a couple quick announcements, um, additional announcements. Let me just show this. So. Um, I mentioned this at the beginning of the meeting, but we're having, uh, uh, can you guys see this? 2021 yes. BA wall artists call for art. So you, uh, the deadline to submit your art to show at the art gallery on the, the space that Boulder Art Association have, has there is March 14th. And uh, you just uh, send three sample images to uh, the email on the screen and uh, that we're gonna hire a juror to pick the 10 artists that we'll be displaying in 2021. And um, I also wanted to um, just uh, announce again that our March member meeting is gonna be um, a, a how to critique with purpose, which will be led by Virginia Unsaled. And on Tuesday, March 9th, 2021, uh, please go to our website for information on how to submit images for that critique. And I think that's going to be a really fun. Last time um, Virginia did one of these for our group, we had a full house. So I think it's going to be a very popular one again also. And uh, Randy, you, you had a lot of people on today. So this was, this was great. Um, I, I think that's it for today, unless anybody has any other questions or comments or announcements or anything. So uh, thank you so much, Randy. It was, it well, was I want to thank you guys for having me. I really enjoyed it. And I uh, look forward to seeing all of you in person this year, sometime yeah. here in the future. Yeah. Thanks. And thank I'm going to hang on. We'll hang on for a few minutes if anybody wants to copy any of the links out of the chat or also follow any of the folks who put their Instagram accounts in. Uh, Randy, are you on Instagram? I am. Hale underscore gallery. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I haven't followed you, so I need to do that. Um, yes, uh, thanks so much, everyone. Please, please uh, join us next time. And uh, thanks for being here. Bye, and everybody. Thank you thank so you much, Randy. Thank you very much, Randy. Yeah, and thanks work. for your donation of your painting. I'll get, I'll get this up to Annie and let her uh, get it with you guys. And you can figure out what to do with it. So yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> our next show, we might have it as part of our uh, auction it off or something. Yeah. 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 We really My pleasure. That. Thank you. You bet. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll see you guys soon. I'm going to leave. All righty. Bye. Bye. Thanks again. Bye guys.